everybody. Welcome to Star Trek Fleet Week with uh, Cryptic Studios and Star Trek Online. I'm Amy Imhoff, and I'm going to be hosting the Science of Starships today. Welcome, welcome. I have some great people here to join me. I'm going to go around and have you introduce yourself. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I work with the Star Trek franchise and with other um, technology and STEM clients. I am Kate Mulgrew's media director. So if you see her at a convention, I'm generally not far behind. Uh, but I'm here with some excellent people who are brilliant and ready to talk about starships and science. So how about Dr. Erin McDonald? Why don't you kick it off and tell everybody what you do? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Erin. I've got a PhD in astrophysics, particularly in general relativity and gravitational waves. I have been working as the Star Trek science advisor basically for three years now, almost exactly, um, for all the shows. And uh, yeah, so I started with Star Trek Discovery season three with my friend and colleague, Professor Mohammed Noor. And then I've basically worked on every single show after uh, Picard season one, Lower Deck season one, and Discovery season two, everything after that. So I'm excited to be here. Awesome. You're doing such good work, I have to say. I, I enjoy seeing you at the different conventions and all of your perspectives you. and, you know, just everything about space. And we're going to we're going to kick it over to Dr. Noor. He's going to tell us a little bit about what he does. Sure. Uh, my name is Mohamed Noor. I'm a professor of biology at Duke University. I'm currently serving as interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences there. Uh, in terms of Star Trek, I'm occasionally consulted as a basically as contracted as a consultant. I'm not on the I'm not on retainer like Dr. Aaron McDonald is. But you know, occasionally if they need a little bit of biology help, they might reach out and be like, "Hey, Mohammed, can you help us out with something?" So that's that's my pitching in, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. And thanks for hosting. Great, thank you, Mohammed. It's great to have you. And of course, we last but definitely not least, the legendary Rick Sternbach. Rick, why don't you tell us what you are what you're doing, what you've been up to, and what you've worked on with Star Trek? Well, I, you know, I, I started out as a an, uh, as an astronomical and science fiction illustrator back in the early '70s. Um, uh, got uh, got really interested in Star Trek um, and uh, was able to meet with Gene Roddenberry at a, a showing of the Cage at Yale University in 1974. Okay, and. Uh, you know, Gene said uh, he, he wanted us to get another show together or a movie or something. It wouldn't happen for another four years. Uh, but uh, eventually I got hired on Star Trek, the motion picture and uh, worked with a great group of people there. Uh, Mike Miner, and Lee Cole and uh, 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 Joe Jennings and uh, Harold Michelson and uh, people like that. And uh, and then uh, later on got to uh, uh, got to come on board with the next generation, and didn't leave for another fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, ship design. Uh, you know, uh, working on some of the tech with uh, Michael Kuda and uh, uh, hundreds of props and graphics and things. So it uh, it was uh, it was a real trip. So Rick made the the modern Star Trek look the way we we love it to look. You you created that look. You you brought it to life. Well, there's there's been a great team of of you know illustrators and designers over the years, and I just I just love seeing everything continue. Everything looks awesome. The new team's doing a great job, but they wouldn't be where they are if they didn't have your shoulders to stand on. So, thank you for all your work in making something that we love look amazing. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to, so we're a little bit about how we're going to structure it today. I'm going to ask the panel a couple questions. We're going to go around and get your, your different answers and weigh in in your different areas of expertise. And then we're going to give you a little time to mention maybe something that we didn't get to touch on. And then we're going to throw it over to the chat and we're going to get some questions. So I wanted to kick it off by asking um, Dr. Aaron and Dr. Muhammad. I was going to say doctor before your name. I feel like I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but I want to ask you guys a little bit about how you apply your two different areas of expertise, you know, you, biology and astrophysics. Both of those go hand in hand with Star Trek plots and the way uh, writers are approaching the episode topics and the way that our stories are going to go. So if you wanted to weigh in a little bit about that and how you advise them and where your expertise comes in. Erin, uh, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, we'll, we'll kind of bounce this back and forth because uh, our very first 
sort of job was for season three of Discovery. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that. Oh no, mine's down. Well, well, I'm scared. <laughs> he has visual yeah. uh, props that he wanted. No problem. Yeah, but we um it was really funny because this was Michelle Paradise had taken over for Star Trek Discovery and she was they had sort of framed out the idea of the burn and she was looking for some science advisors to come in and help build a backbone for science for the story and so she was talking to some people with an astrophysics background and she was talking to some people with a biology background and uh as we had the conversation and she wanted to go forward having me um help with the sort of physics side of things she said oh yeah we've also hired a a biologist to help with the biology side of things we'll connect you guys and I was like oh you know do you know who it is and she said yeah uh professor uh muhammad noor from duke i was like muhammad because <laughs> we had already been giving talks together at dragon con on the science of star trek and so it was like such a delight to be paired together to work on that storyline and and we kind of worked i mean i'll, I'll throw it over to you to kind of continue telling the story but sure. we basically worked in tandem but you know, really was two different facets of the burn. So I kind of focused on like the dilithium, the resonant frequencies that they're hit uh, when the cry happens um, and all of those things. But then I was like, I don't know how to explain the rest of it. So <laughs> <laughs> Professor Noor, yeah. Yeah, the, the story starts off the same with me. I had the call with uh, Michelle Paradise and she said, we're going to pair you up with a physicist. Oh, who is it? Oh, it's Dr. Aaron McDowell. I was like, oh my God, I love Aaron. <laughs> so that, that was fantastic. <laughs> Dr. I mentioned we'd already been working together. But yeah, I mean, we, we got this idea for, the, or we were given this idea for the burn. My part was the opposite in the sense, okay, like this has to be connected in some way to this unique biology of some alien individual that's somehow going to cause this cataclysmic physical event. So I focused more on the other half of it. Like what's the biology side? Why would this person be so radically different? And how could it connect to this physics, physics part? But what Dr. Aaron and I did, I mean, we we you know we had we had various phone calls and emails and things like we even created a Google Doc and started tossing things together, sometimes in real time. <laughs> so, and eventually we framed out an idea and presented it to them. So yeah, and just to clarify a little more, it was like they had come up with the emotional storyline, so they had yeah. sort of used that classic sci-fi idea that you have a big cataclysmic event that happens and it's really rooted in the emotional journey of one individual, and then we were brought in to sort of build the science behind that. Awesome. Yeah, I found that to be fascinating, so the way they structured that and the way they wove that together, you know, with, um, with you know, the, the alien physiology and how that meshed. Did you did you have any kind of a, a weigh in on the, the physiology aspect of it, Dr. Noor? So, yeah, it, this is challenging, right? Because, I mean, most most people don't scream and destroy, <laughs> destroy warp fields everywhere. <laughs> so my focus for my side of it, too, is much more just on, like, what will make this this individual truly unique? And what Star Trek tends to fall back on a little bit too often is just this idea, oh, it's a mutation. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> mutations don't work that way. So I tried to figure out, like, well, okay, what are things that that can create something to be unique from the way it was? So the, the idea, this was actually sketched out, and credit to Dr. Aaron McDonald for the idea of doing this. We actually sketched out the idea in some detail in an article in Star Trek.com, which is called something like the science behind the burn, or behind Star Trek's burn, something like that. But the idea there is that somehow in utero, like, or basically, before, essentially when he was with like a single-celled embryo, his chromosome numbers doubled. So he actually became something, rather than having two copies of every gene like we have, we get one set from our mom, one set from our dad, he would actually have four. And that actually happens with some individuals, not, not you know, not mammals or anything like that, but some frogs and fish and lots of plants. You sometimes have this doubling and it creates something which is truly unique. And then just when you create something that's unique, you have the opportunity to then play around with, okay, what about him now is now unique? Because now it's essentially we've, we've cleared the slate from the standard expectations and that gives an opportunity for, you know, making it so that he happens to scream at a particular frequency, which is unique from other aspects. And I'll toss that over to Dr. Aaron about the resonant frequency aspect. Yeah, because it was really fun for me, the idea that like, okay, all the dilithium is going to shatter because of this cry. So let's build some science into dilithium. And that was yeah. really the fun challenge because you're like, oh, God, dilithium has been around since 1966, <laughs> like, you yeah. know, in the Star Trek universe. So what do we know about it? And what can we add to it that doesn't contradict anything that's been said before? So that was coming up with the idea that like the um, subatomic particles of dilithium are also containing some subspace component because the cry had to happen faster than the speed of light, but not instantaneously. And so we kind of built out a lot of that um, science of dilithium that is not contradicting the, the stuff that's come before. So that was really a pleasure for me to be able to have the honor of contributing to dilithium canon. 
And it also seemed that when the the wave kind of emanated outward from where he was located, they were able to backtrack it. And that seemed like the mm-hmm. science was was uh, it was almost like a, like a whale, you know, with the sonar. Yeah. And you were able to backtrack it. So was that part of your was that part of also your thought process? Well, that was like why it couldn't be instantaneous because part of the plot for the season was that they were going to tr- what, what you were just explaining is called triangulation that they were going to see at what point different parts of the galaxy had been hit by the burn and even if it's just fractions of a second different, you can retrace that back to find an origin point as long as you have three or more. That's why it's called triangulation because you can build a sort of triangle with the different points and then trace back the origin. Yeah, and I've definitely seen that in other plots, but not used kind of quite this way. You know, will it, where they'll triangulate, like, where something is located. Like, I can think of, like, in Ghostbusters, they did that, where they <laughs> figured out where the fault lines were and where it was coming from. So, but it's it's an interesting way to do it when you're when you're thinking on, like, a galactic scale, right? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, we're talking a little bit about the relationship of science and Star Trek. Obviously, Star Trek uh, and Starfleet are, everyone is, uh, you know, exploring science, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. science is their foundation. And I wanted to say, you know, how you apply the role of science to Star Trek ships within the mythos of mm-hmm. canon that we have. So, if we wanted to talk, you can, this can be go to anybody if you want to raise your hand or um, maybe Rick, you can talk a little bit about the role of ships within the mythos of Trek. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> Me too. You know, uh, uh, starships. Okay, you know, first of all, they 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 go faster than light, which we can't do now. But within within the context of of the show, okay, uh, FTL flight is you know it's a given. It, you know, we do it all the time. Um, and for me, the 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 science of uh, you know getting a ship up to speed and uh, you know past. Uh, Warp factor one. Um, you know, I draw on a lot of the experience that I had talking with uh, people like Robert Bessard, Robert Howard, Robert Ensman. I, it's pretty strange that the three guys are named Bob. You know, Bob. Tell, tell our audience what the three Bobs do. Yeah, and you know, and learning about the different propulsion schemes that could possibly get us, you know, out into you know, uh, nearby stars and things. And then how do you, how do you go faster than that? Um, and for, for, for those, you know, for those sorts of things, I mean, yeah, it's a bit of hand waving, but, uh, I relied on Dr. Stephen Howe, uh, who was with, um, Los Alamos, uh, you know, (laughs) Los Alamos labs. Right. And, and, and Steve has been working with antimatter, you know, for the longest time and taught me things about how you could mix deuterium and anti-deuterium together in the warp reactor, you know, and then how do you get that that energy out to the nacelles, right? What are the nacelles made of? What are the warp coils made of? So we made up a lot of this back on next gen. Um, just to give the writers, you know, something to latch onto, and modify if if they had to for for the drama, you know, um, and you know, we eventually came up with uh, a thing that that uh, you know, I I like to talk about it in terms of like your car, okay? You have a fuel tank, mm-hmm. right? The fuel reacts inside the engine. The mm-hmm. motive power is then sent to the drive shaft to the rear axle and where the rubber meets the road was the warp coils okay and we made up a lot of uh you know how does warp fields how do warp fields uh push against the universe Hmm. (laughs) you know uh again it's 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 hand waving but it's smart hand waving and that's those are the kind of things that that I you know I applied to my designs, you know even if we never saw uh, a certain tech point in an episode, that's fine. The writers could go back and and you know explain things like that or come up with a dramatic point uh, having to do with warp flight or some other bit of the starship. And when I talk about your car, you know. The fuel in your tank, all right, it, you know, think about it this way. It turns into your air conditioning, your radio, um, 
you know, the, the, the heater in the car, all of this comes from the stuff in the tank. And that's the way I explained it to, you know, to folks like Jerry Taylor um, on the show. Jerry, think about it like it was your car, <laughs> you know, and she loved it. She got it. That's great. And I always think it's it's helpful for the people who don't have the kind of background that you three have um, to watch the show and have them give, you know, they give it an analogy, you know, something colorful and something fun. And, mm -hmm. you know, coming up with that analogy and also relating it to, you know, like, like if Tom Paris were to say something about, you know, loving the internal combustion engine, like the, the viewer, the guest, they, we understand that. Um, so the the science of how dilithium and the matter antimatter is rooted in these things that, you know, the, the experts that you've talked to have mentioned. Um, how about a, so maybe a little bit more expanding on that because you're kind of bridging the gap between like science and art direction at that point, right? So if you were giving art direction and how things look and how a starship looks and how the nacelles look and how the engine room, you know, with the big, the warp core in the middle, how does that, how does that translate then? How, you know, and I, I want Rick to weigh in and then I want to get Aaron and Mohammed's opinions also. Well, you know, again, back on Next Gen and, and even, even for me, I mean, back on, on Star Trek and motion picture where, uh, you know, the script would say a certain thing, right? You know, the engine is you know lighting up and and uh, making a you know a and, and, you know so so in the art department okay uh you know production designers like joe jennings and harold michelson you know could could take what we saw in the script okay uh and what uh you know what would uh Ronberry and uh, some of the other producer people were you know looking for um you know for the sets uh, you know, in, in the art department, you know, with set designers uh, and, and some of us doing, you know, graphics and sketching, uh, we would take those ideas and flesh them out and they become blueprints and the blueprints go to the mill and the mill makes them real, you know, and, and the, the, the stage effects people come in and do, uh, you know, the lighting and uh, um, you, you know, the, the visual effects people come in and do their shots and, you know, add the, uh, uh, you know, the, the CG and uh, the practical light effects and, and things like that. And it all turns real. The yeah. magic of, of filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> How about well, you, Erin? And I know you've had a little bit of time behind the camera also to kind of talk about, um, yeah. you know, the way that formulate the way science kind of informs, you know, your writing and the story. And, and you know, I, I was fortunate enough to see uh, a short film that uh, that Erin did. Uh, last month when I was in LA. So great work. And it also had a science component. So how do you bring that in when, how do you kind of examine it when you see it in other places, not in Star Trek, of course, but also, you know, through other space focused shows? Yeah, no, thank you. I think, I think what, what Rick was mentioning is a really good point about how there is this sort of, um, you have to take all the components into account. And so when we're, and I'm fortunate with the role that I have within Star Trek, especially is that like, yes, I primarily work with the writers or I primarily work with the showrunner, but as that trust and relationship grows, then we start to fold in more of like working with the director for that episode or working with the visual effects team for the episode. And a lot of it will be like, look, this is what we want to do. This is how I'm visualizing it without even the dialogue, without any of the story, but just purely the visuals of how maybe the ship is going to look or how the nebula is going to look or the planet's going to have some weird, cool effects to it. And then they're able to ask like, could you explain that with science? Like, this is what we want to do. Is this outrageous? And, <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, that's really cool. I can't explain that. But this is how I would maybe reframe it, or at least this is how I would explain that effect. And that might not even ever make it into the dialogue, but at least we know what I like to call it is that we have a backbone of science, that at least we've created some framework that, you know, as Rick mentioned, that the writers can work off of, and they might not ever have to explain it. The actors can work off of it. It might not ever be explained, but there is that trust, I think, as a viewer, once you see it, you feel like there's some cohesion and some explanation going on because it's not just stuff thrown out without any really sort of relation to each other. I think Star Trek is really good at, at finding ways to just create this behind the scenes science and technology component 
that then bleeds into the stories as much or as little as needed. And I know that they've had show Bibles and the Okudas have done that and they bring that in for the, the, mm-hmm. the cast and the crew so that, you know, I remember, you know, hearing the, the actors talk about how they make it sound believable and natural when they're doing their their dialogue and, you know, writing those aspects and having you consult on writing those aspects um, really brings in that that element of, of realism and makes us believe that they're, you know, these are the experts. This is what they're talking about. How about you, uh, Muhammad? Well, I agree with everything that everybody said so far. And and, and one aspect, is, actually, I'll quote Dr. Aaron McDonald something like, basically, the, the, the point is, the point is never to say no. The point is to figure out a way to make it work, right? Because I mean, otherwise, if we just say no, what's going to happen is you're just going to get the analogy I like to use is an invisibility gun, which I think is the stupid, this doesn't exist in Star Trek, but it's just a stupid idea. Like, what? how can a gun just <laughs> shoot and make something invisible? It doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> if we're not going to allow the invisibility gun, then we have to figure out some sort of way for doing it. So, like, you know, for my part, I mean, again, like Dr. Aaron, though, she's done it obviously a lot more than I have. Is, you know, I try to ha- just have some sort of backbone. So, for example, when I, and at the same time as we worked on the the burn for season three, I had a separate contract uh, related to um, basically a, a scene or a, a part of scenes in uh, episode five related to this disease that some aliens had. What I did is not only did I send them some dialogue and some explanations, but I actually put literature citations in there just so there we know this is good. There, here are some examples of where this has worked in the context of the burn. For example, one thing I put was some citations showing that there are some polyploids. These are organisms that have more than two copies their genes that are more resistant to radiation. Oh, well, look, Sukal had to sit in that radiation uh, environment, radiation-filled environment for a very long time and obviously had to live, whereas we saw Saru immediately was starting to fall apart. So, you know, basically just having some sort of basis there to, you know, in the long run, if somebody's asking you to defend, like, how is this impossible? No, that's ridiculous. Like, well, actually, let me show you a way that it could potentially work, you know, at least oh. having some sort of, as, as Dr. Aaron said, a backbone to it. I see Rick laughing at that. Do you have a Do you have a thought on that, or maybe an anecdote that you'd like to share? Maybe an instance where that's happened, where you've made it work. Well, you know, I I, I can tell you that the uh, you know over the uh, over the fourteen or fifteen years that uh, you know I was with uh, the franchise, um, Michael Kuda and I wrote a, at least fourteen hundred pages worth of memos. When when we were suggesting tech and science things and, uh, you know, recommending people to talk to. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't always get it right. And the producers didn't always, you, you know, listen to, to the suggestions. But, uh, um, you know, in, in my experience, they were very, very good listeners, like 75 percent of the time, you know, um, and when you, you know, you know, when when we heard lines of dialogue that we suggested actually, you, you know, pop up in the dailies, it's it's like, oh, 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 <laughs> like that was me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should add that the I should add the showrunners are very very curious too. Like they actually want to know the science. It's not that like whatever, just give me a word and then I'm, I'll move on. They're very curious and very interested in this stuff. And I, and that's part of what makes it such a pleasure to work with these teams because they they're genuinely interested in this science too. Did we lose Amy? Oh no! We lost oh no! Fearless <laughs> spirit. Oh, oh, you're back. Oh, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> We lost you briefly. Oh no. I mean, I'll I'll vamp a little bit while Amy is coming back. But like um one of the things Rick said about um being able to hear your words and your suggestions get spoken, I think is one of like the greatest honors and one of the coolest things that ever happened. So you're just like, ah, that, <laughs> I was able to do this. So yeah, it's uh it looks like we have Amy back, but yeah, it's just really I exciting. I think I'm back. I think I'm back. You know what I did? I closed the Twitch stream. Ah. So that so that I could be able to more effectively hear us. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's all right. Can I ask Rick a question? <laughs> sure, yes, go ahead. Please ask Rick a question. I would like to know what your favorite part, like favorite technical component of a starship that you were able to oh. contribute to, or just add some technology onto, is. Where you're like, oh, that's my baby. <laughs> Whether or not you invented it, but you're just very attached to it. For for me, I think it's a warp drive. Mm. We love a good warp. That's drive. a big one. <laughs> that's a very, very <laughs> fundamentally big one. <laughs> but you know, what is it about? Oh, please. 
Oh. Oh, I think she was going to ask, what is it about the warp core that you love? Are you there? Am I yep. here? Yep. Yep. I'm so sorry, you guys. I said, what What visually is it about the warp core that you like how it's presented? And then, you know, there's, there's, there's so much energy involved. There's, there's, uh, uh, you know the sound and the light, and uh, you know, and then you cut, you 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 cut to the exterior, and the ship goes, whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love it. What's your yeah. favorite thing you worked great. on? Yeah, there, and right? I just wanted to double check. I'm still here. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes, you're, you're good. You're... Okay, great. This is good. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about scientific concepts applied to ship specific functions, not just the warp core, but other stuff like uh, the bioneural gel packs in oh Voyager, for example, you know, some of these aspects of our favorite starships, you know, the deflector dish is something that's really relied heavily on in uh, the way we able to wrap up the plot and save the day. Um, so maybe you want to, let's see, who, who wants to go first? We have maybe Rick, you want to go first and talk a little bit about Voyager and the bioneural gel packs and how those aspects of the ship uh really give it that unique quality because it's you know a hero ship it's a character in the show we talked a lot about that yeah yeah well and and, and uh, of course uh, you know we, we saw that the gel pack could get sick um yeah and, and i will i will leave that to to you guys to to talk about uh but uh, you know when when the uh, when the concept of of the uh uh gel pack uh popped up in the script or you know popped up in the synopsis it's like oh Okay, I've heard about things like this, you know, and and can you can you uh, create a medium in which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. artificial neurons could grow mm -hmm. uh, and organize? Uh, and I, I think it was terrific. I mean, I worked on the design of the hardware, um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I I left it to others to like make the concept work. How about you? Oh, Mohammed, you have a follow-up. What would you like I, to say? I have a fun follow-up. So uh, um, Rick was just mentioning this idea of could you get this clusters of neurons to grow. There was actually an article just published in Nature magazine within the past two weeks about organoids, right? These are these basically not full organs, but these little clusters of cells that kind of have functions like organs. They're really hard to actually get right, to get them similar to what we have or what, what living organisms have. But you know, a big advance was made where they actually took one of these little organoids for, for a human brain and they put it into an embryonic mouse. And it was actually able to grow and, and self-organize in, in a way and such that it actually was, you know, somewhat functional. Now, obviously, to be clear, like the mouse didn't start speaking English or anything like that. It wasn't that extreme. But that would have been something else. <laughs> that would have been something else. But it's an interesting example of like taking this this little piece of something and then growing out and using it in a different way. In this case, it was, it was putting it into a different biological background instead of into a fully synthetic background. But it's still it's still a neat idea. I've always tried to I've always tried to understand exactly why they would want these bioneural gel packs because. Nerves, I don't think, are as fast as just like if you just have straight old like you know wire current sort of thing. But one advantage that they do have, especially if you have something that's very heavily branched, nerves when they fire, you don't actually have any reduction in the signal as they go. So I think you know Dr. Aaron probably knows this better than me as a physicist, but I'm assuming that if you have something going along a long wire, you're going to lose a little bit because of you know, you know some of it will be transferring to heat and other sorts of losses along there, but. A nerve, I mean, what happens is you have this you have this electrical signal across the nerve and a chemical one that goes to the next one. But what happens is each nerve is turned on and it goes at full power. So you can think of it like a stretch of like explosives. So it's like bam, 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 bam. You know, the fifth explosive is no less, you know, of an explosion than the first. Whereas if you had it more as just a straight up signal, you might actually lose a little bit of that strength, especially if it ends up being really long. So that, that's my one thinking is especially if you had something that was very heavily branched that potentially would allow for some sort of advantage of doing it this way instead of just straight up electricity. But I'm just, I'm just you know, I'm spitballing here. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a fascinating, I thought it was a fascinating concept when they first introduced it. Yeah. Um, how about you, Aaron? What are your thoughts? I know you're a big Voyager fan. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, but I'm not, um, I don't have the biology background to speak to how biogel nerve bags work. Well, maybe but, from um, a, a scientist in a different discipline, a kind of uh, in opinion slash the way you watch it, the way you yeah the way you assimilated that that knowledge. No, I think that's that's a really good point. You know, something we talk about is like if you're a scientist and there's aspects that are not necessarily your field, there's an element of just being a smell test that you're just like, does this 
as with my scientific training, does this logically make sense? Like, can't do I buy this? Or do do my radars start to go off and be like, ah, I'm not sure about that. That sounds like it's wrong. And it might be right. It might just be an aspect of like a different field that I've never heard of. And so you look it up and you're like, oh yeah, that is a thing. That's pretty cool. Um, but it's always good to be aware of that because 90% of the audience is going to have that same reaction that they're going to like hear some techno babble and maybe be like, ah, oh, that does, mm, not sure if that sounds right. But um, I think, uh, yeah, for me, the the gel packs, I just, I always like it as a plot device. I think it's really cool. And, you know, we've looked a lot at like um, how particularly like our neurons, just because that's, that's kind of what we're looking at, um, can model uh, a hive mind tech, like the fact that, you know, they've used studying ants and how ants sort of communicate with each other, which is not a literal hive mind. They're not sharing one brain that's telling them what to do, but they have like that uh, intelligence swarm, I think is the way they phrase it. And using those models to look at how the brain works and how the brain communicates with different parts. It's just really cool that you can like look at things like artificial intelligence, how our brain works, how intelligence swarm acts, and then even just turn that into technology because a lot of that research on intelligent swarms and modeling that to brain behavior has gone towards uh, designing how artificial limbs can react to uh, thought patterns. And so, um, so just understanding that biology and technology are really tightly integrated and that there are applications across the board, I just think is fascinating. And then I call Muhammad and say, hey, can you give me a little more explanation on that? I love those calls. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, what you were saying just then about um, artificial intelligence, you know, we talked, we saw a lot of that happening in Discovery recently with Zora. And, you know, maybe if you guys have weighed in a little bit on that, also 10 Species 10C, I know that, you know, you, you both kind of worked on that as well. Um, I'm sure the our viewers would love to hear you talk about that. So whoever wants to go first, uh, 10C and Zora, because Zora being part of the ship and the ship being a character, you know, we, we, we always we have that through line with Majel from the, you know, the legacy shows and and how she is kind of a character and how the, the ship talks back to the, the crew. And then Zora is actually interacting on like an intelligence level and an adapting level as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, just quickly, because there wasn't, I think with Zora, it wasn't so much uh, embedding a ton of science into that. It was that we're developing that as a character more, that the ship is becoming more of a character. And I really love that reveal where, you know, she decides to not give them the coordinates because it's going to cause them harm. And that's like a very sort of Asimov type storyline, right? Yeah. Of like, I'm here to protect you. So I'm going to make these decisions. And then how do you, how do you reconcile that? So it's a little less on the science side and just more of like a philosophical application of artificial intelligence, which Star Trek has had a long legacy of telling great stories with. Um, and then for, for 10C, you know, I didn't, I didn't do much on the, those designs or anything. I know, uh, Professor Noor and I worked a lot um, on the language aspect. There was also a group of people from METI, the Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence Organization, yeah. who helped talk about how that language was formulated. I think for me, my contribution for the 10C in that language was really looking at, you know, when you communicate with a species, you, um, a lot of people are like, well, math's a universal language, and that's kind of METI's philosophy as well. So how do yeah. you communicate? using math, how do you establish communication that way? But you can't really start with one plus one equals two. And if anyone had to take abstract algebra in college, I'm gonna apologize right now, cause I had, I got really bad flashbacks. Um, but it's like, <laughs> you take one plus one equals two and you think that that's a good way to establish communication. But mathematically, you have to establish what one is. You have to establish what plus is. You have to establish what equals is. And so like what set of numbers are you working with? What are the rules for those? Is, you know, one or zero your identifying operator? Like all of these different things. And um, and it and so that's kind of where I was able to say like, no, you need to take one further step back when you're establishing these math rules. But I know Professor Noor did a lot of sort of the alien design and fun of the, some of the cool stuff with that. Yeah, it was, it was very fun. I, I, actually, it's interesting to think about the timeline for it because so the discussions about this, you know, go back to, you know, June, July, 2020. So, and uh, to be clear, those episodes came out in March, 2022. So there was a long time there from the initial conception to the actual, you know, seeing it on the screen. 
But what Michelle Paradise had said the, in those earlier meetings was she wants some aliens that are truly aliens, something where the universal translator is not going to work at all. And, you know, some sort of mode of communication where that's not that, that's going to be really challenging. So I pushed this idea of like, well, let's do chemical communication. That's something we don't see a lot of in Star Trek. But in the animal kingdom, it's super common. So it's a little bit funny in that sense. We don't see it in Star Trek. It's just because, you know, we humanoids don't use it so much. So that that was really fun working that out and saying, well, let's do it by hydrocarbons and then sketching out what kind of hydrocarbons we'd use. I remember one of the initial designs had some very, very simple hydrocarbons there and i was like okay that's gonna smell like a fart that's not gonna make you love you know so <laughs> you need to have something yeah you have something that's gonna be uh you no know, i love that that was your feedback that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> they like that too but, so i said it has to be like unique complex hydrocarbons that we haven't actually seen before there is a, a challenge to this and this is this comes back to something that dr aaron mentioned earlier that like why should these pheromones have the same effect on us as they did on said seeds? We're not close to related. Obviously, we encounter other species from us, and we're not uh, we're not we don't respond to them. This is one of those cases where we just acknowledge the problem and move on rather than rather than trying to retcon that because there, there isn't really a way to retcon that. So Saru made a passing comment and they're saying, "Oh, that's really funny that it affects me and all of you and all everybody else the same way." Like, yep, it's kind of like the inertial dampeners or any of those other sorts <laughs> of things. We're just gonna... Yes, it is fascinating. Yeah, Moving on, is, indeed, <laughs> we wouldn't have expected that, but so be it. But yeah, as Dr. Aaron mentioned, we had the the, the consultants from Medi who are working with us, uh, Douglas Vaykoch and Sherry you know Wells Jensen. The member of Medi is uh, Anson Mount. I That's found that out recently in my conversations with the space community. I don't. Uh, so, you know, the, the captain is all in support of messaging extraterrestrial life. <laughs> I got the impression that maybe he was the one who hooked them up with Michelle Paris, but I don't know that for sure. I know he was definitely on the email threads about this, as we were talking about early on. So I think maybe he was part of the connection in this regard. That's too. great. I love that we're bridging that gap between, um, and we need to do more of that, which is bridge the gap between the Star Trek community and the fan base and what's really happening in space and aero and technology. And I think, you know, having work bringing these experts in and bring those experts that Rick worked with, and then now you guys, um, is really helping explore these ideas of, of what like life would look like on you know a macroscopic level and a microscopic level and the creatures that in the 10c i thought that was great because star trek is of course you know it's a lot of bipedal species with funny foreheads <laughs> so it was a nice opportunity to kind of bring in the different forms of life that that we're seeing and also have them communicate in a way that is they're not just evil, right? They're, yeah. we, we're, we're upset about what they're doing, but they don't know that, right? Yeah. That was that that tech, the communication level I thought was yeah. also fascinating. Yeah. Um, and Strange New Worlds did that a little bit with uh, Uhura and the communicating with music, which I thought mm -hmm. was delightful, of course. And that's a that's like a whole other set of of expertise that you can bring in to Star Trek on like a, you know, and musical notes translating to math essentially. You know, and I was wondering, Rick, do you have any um, anything you want to weigh in on some of the new Star Trek that we're seeing that are really relying heavily on these on these scientific concepts? Well, I I, I have to admit that I have not seen a lot of episodes of the of the new shows, but uh, the the ones that I have seen, I am I am very much buoyed up, um, you know, about the franchise, and uh, you know, I think it's in great hands. And, uh, you know, I will I will eventually catch up. No, great. I just I wanted to get your thoughts on that, because, you know, you're you're coming at it from, a you know, a legacy point of view or you, you know, you've had worked on that and you you're bringing, you know, that knowledge back into, you know, this next era of Star Trek. Well, well you know, I, yeah. I, I, the one, one thing I, I found very interesting is, is uh, you know, some of these ship designs uh, look, um, you know, very familiar. OK. Saucer, engineering hull, pylons, nacelles, and other ships. Uh, it's like, wait a second, these nacelles aren't connected. I okay. saw that in the chat. And I wanted to bring that <laughs> up. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think to myself, okay, I wouldn't have done it that way, but uh, who am I to say? Um, you know, it's something new and interesting. And and one of the things that the producers. Um, um, really wanted, you know, back during my franchise years was, uh, you know, every so often, let's mix it up. Let's do something new. Let's do something really interesting that we've never seen before. Okay. And that was great because I could like sharpen my pencils and get back, you know, into it. That's great. How about Erin? What are your thoughts on the, uh, the detached nacelles and how that could work? Yeah, I mean, so what's interesting is, you know, those, again, 
thinking about your role, like you don't necessarily touch everything as they are developed, right? And especially when you're starting out in a show, the season, first season you work on is really like, is this relationship going to work? Is this? And so a lot of like the ship design stuff, the visual effects might not have been something that I was necessarily involved in, but we can still have those conversations about what kind of science could be involved now that we've seen this and now that this exists. And so for me, what was a really fun challenge for going forward, you know, into the future that Discovery did was that, um, you know, try to think of what's the through line. Like we have sort of the 24th century technology, right? And now we're going forward like another few hundred, 900 years more into the future. So where does technology go from there? And I think, um, you know, things like the detached nacelles, the analogy I like to give for that is five years ago when I wanted to charge my phone, I had to plug it in. Now I can set it on something that charges it wirelessly, right? Like that's a natural through the line of sort of technology evolving. And it's a very simple example compared to having entire nacelles, you know, detached from the ship, but things like using induction, things like, and imagining too, all of the technology they have regarding subspace or regarding like quantum entanglement or all the other things that like we don't have a handle on now, could still be something that they have in the future. So it's really, I know I've said this word a couple of times, but it really is developing a through line. I think the other good example that we had for discovery far in the future was the programmable matter. That it's like, we go from what we have now being 3D printing, right? Which didn't even exist when replicators were an idea. And, you know, then you get replicators, which sort of quickly assemble matter from other matter into something recognizable. Now you have adaptive essentially replicators that are 900 years beyond what you have for a replicator. So there are these thoughts on like, um, how do you see these through lines of technology evolving? And it is a challenge and people are going to come up with ideas that not everyone agrees with, but you still can, you know, see where the inspiration for that has come from. It's not just made up without any thought. Yeah. And I love that you brought up the, the way our technology has been changing so rapidly you know, what is the, what is it going to look like in 900 years? You know, that's, that's basically the question that, you know, art directors have to answer, you know, what is, what is the, the function of this, but also, you know, what's the aesthetic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how is that, how is that informing our environment? Um, and I was wondering, you know, Rick, if you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, bringing the science into some of the props you design, you know, maybe you can pick like one or two props that you really feel proud of and that you like the functionality of and just talk about that a little bit because I want to hear more about what you did for, for in that aspect of art direction. Well, my, my uh, you know, uh, uh, my, my time with props, you know, really started with Next Gen, okay, where we had to basically reinvent everything, okay? Uh, uh, you know, again, it's, okay, does it make sense scientifically and technically and does it look cool okay so we have to balance that right uh so yeah i got you know got into the communicator got into the uh, tricorder um the hypo spray <laughs> the hypo spray was inspired by my asthma inhaler <laughs> no way that's honestly the technology of star trek that i wish were real is the hypo spray because i am very phobic of needles uh so i would really like a subdermal transfer that would be well, the, 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 the hypo spray, you know, I, I did a lot of research on it. And I wrote an article for Star Trek, the magazine, and it goes back to things like the jet injector with uh, Robert Hingson back in the 50s and uh, uh, things like that. But, you know, I was I was sitting in my doctor's office because, I, you know, I had like maybe two years where the breathing was a little hard and I had this albuterol inhaler and I'm looking at the thing. I'm holding it in my hand. It's like. It's got it's got a cartridge, it's got a a thing, and it's oh my god, that's it. Okay, <laughs> so you know, uh, Gene Roddenberry wanted everything um, you know in next gen to be uh, you know faster, smaller, easier to use. Okay, uh, and instead of a two-handed injection device that McCoy used, right? It's a one-handed thing, right? Okay, you, you jam in the ampule and boom, okay? And the, the albuterol inhaler was a perfect starting point, okay, for the shapes, all right? Uh, the tricorder, 
Um, they wanted something, you know, smaller, um, you know, fun with lots of, you know, uh, uh, controls and a display. And uh, um, I really wanted a bigger screen on the tricorder, but we, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> uh, and the communicator, I, I started out with a very clunky looking um, uh, electronic thing that stuck to the uniform, right? And Gene Roddenberry looks at my sketches, and we're all in a meeting with the producers, and uh, uh, he looks down and says, why don't you just make it the Starfleet emblem? Oh, boy. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I was looking at it from a hardware standpoint, right? And Gene said, no, just make it the emblem. And that's what we did. And then we fit things into the patch. Okay, and then we eventually got to open up, you know, the, the patch and, and work on it with little tiny, you know, prop tools and things like that. And it became part of the mythos, you know, and we went from there. So I, I, I had a ball working on, <laughs> working on gizmos, you know, but keeping, keeping, keeping the tech straight and keeping it looking cool. <laughs> We're going to ask if anybody has any additional questions. I've already pulled a couple uh, about the, the nacelles and uh, some of the other aspects of the newer Star Trek. Uh, but if anyone has a couple questions you'd like to have the panel to weigh in on, please put them in the chat. And I will have our lovely tech director today, Mike, pull them out for me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think oh, there was something that we wanted that we had talked about in our email thread that we did not quite touch on. And I thought maybe this was a fun topic, which is threshold. How can the warp field create the lizard babies? <laughs> Everyone is ready. <laughs> we have their props. We have our props. <laughs> we keep our love for threshold close. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, want, you want us to answer the question? Yes, I want you to. I want. I want Rick to weigh in specifically, but you're the biologist, so I think you should also weigh in. <laughs> no, the 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 the, the bio and and uh, astrophysical folks can uh, take take that. I mean, I I worked on the shuttle for for you know that episode, and that's about it. <laughs> okay, okay, well, Hamid, really you go cool ahead. Shuttle. But it looks <laughs> good. All of course, I. Yeah, my background kind of is sort of the first part of the episode, and then yeah. Professor Norgan handled the second part of the episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited for me, to genuinely, I love how Threshold explains warp travel. It's absolutely right. When we think about warp drive, it's a bubble of space time that is built around your ship. Now, some like you know, four dimensional bubble, there's a lot of different things to think about, but conceptually think of it like a bubble because mathematically, if you're on the surface of space time, you can't go faster than the speed of light, but space time itself can go faster than the speed of light. And so that carries the ship forward within that bubble. If you wanna go exponentially faster, you can build a bubble around the bubble and think of that like warp factor two, warp factor three, but it's exponential, right? So it's gonna continue to increase and eventually you're gonna hit a hard limit, um, your asymptote, which is gonna be warp factor 10, where you literally would wrap all of space and time around your ship. Um, it's gonna require a lot of energy, it's very dangerous, but the way that they talk about that in the episode is totally, like, I perfectly buy it. Um, and then, like, I like to joke, then Tom Paris's tongue falls out and I hard nope out. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you're handing it over to Muhammad for the bio? I am indeed. <laughs> I love that. I love okay, that. Go ahead, Muhammad. Yeah. And we have, I see some two questions that were pulled out, so we're going to get Muhammad's take Great. and then have a few questions. Sure, sure. Right. Well, yeah, that's a hard one to sell. <laughs> I mean, th there's... So there's some pieces in there where there's some sort of timey-wimey thing, not to use a Doctor Who reference here, but there's a timey-wimey thing where they say this is some future state of human evolution. I mean, one thing I always like to tell people is like, we can't predict what evolution would be now. If there's some weird space-time thing and it's just making him become that, I mean, I can't falsify that because I mean, that's because kind of, it's just out there. But we know it's all true, everything in there, because there was a scientific paper published. I actually have a copy <laughs> of it right here from 2018. If you look yeah, at it, it's, it's a, it, the title is Rapid Genetic and Developmental Morphological Change Following Extreme Celerity. Celerity just meaning speed. <laughs> but look at the authors. Authors are Thomas Paris, Harry Kim, Bolana Torres, 
<laughs> Kes oh, Ocampo. Oh, wonderful. I love yeah. that. I was actually, he said it's an autograph by Robbie McNeil himself, so he's certified That's it as true. Yes, but... he signed off on it. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually published in one of those when it referred to as predatory scientific journals. These are these journals that which pretend to be portraying real science out there, but essentially you just send them whatever and you pay like, you know, X, X many dollars and they just publish it. Some oh, rogue wow. biologist who loves Star Trek can't imagine who <laughs> must have done this. But actually, if you read it, yeah, if you read it, actually, <laughs> if you read it, the results section just recounts the plot of Threshold, but using That's science great. speak. So <laughs> That's awesome. So Best we have a question. Ever. We have a uh, we have a, a, a mostly a a it's mostly a comment, but also a question, and it's for Rick. Um, so the Trexpert says that he is very excited about your Enterprise D blueprints. They are a big part of his childhood, and I had them as well. I used to spread them out and look at them. Um, so how did that come about? How did the development of those come about as a product that we could all purchase? You know, back on Next Generation, uh, you know, we had the ship, and we got to see the sets, and we got to see the bridge, and, uh, um, and you know, we, we would... Uh, start imagining, okay, what is in the rest of the ship, um, you know, outside of the, the sets that we could see. Uh, and, uh, you know, talking with um, uh, pocketbooks, you know, Simon & Schuster about, uh, you know, various publication things. Um, the suggestion, I think, popped up from, from one of the editors at pocketbooks, you know, how about some blueprints? Okay, <laughs> you know, and it it ultimately took like at least a year to get uh, uh, a few other artists uh, together who you know who were good at uh, um, you know technical drawing, pen and ink. Uh, we did, we had our you know we had our computers, but they were not able at the time you know to to hold an entire deck in memory. OK, and we pleaded with Apple, you know, give us some more RAM, please. Um, but we did a lot of this old school, OK, pen and ink, uh, you know, a lot of drafting work um, and uh, uh, eventually got, um, you know, these 13 sheets together um, and, and pocketbooks published them. And uh, I, I, I guess the, the 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 question I get asked the most is, where, where's cetacean ops? <laughs> <laughs> where's the bathroom? <laughs> and I, you know, it's, it's down on decks 14, 13, 12. <laughs> and one of the greatest awesome. things is that lower decks brought back cetacean ops. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a thing. We are, we are hitting up against time. Like one crazy thing I want to mention, the whole reason to cetacean ops, I think, became a thing was, um, there was that one episode of TNG where uh, uh, it was mentioned over the PA system. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joshua Kim, please report to Cetacean Ops. Well, Josh is my my son, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, amazing. And Cetacean Ops became canon, and it got worked into the blueprints. Okay, so you know, and and it all we you know we also worked it into the tech manual. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, talking about the different, uh, uh, whale and dolphin species and what they are really good at is navigation. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I love it. Very true. Awesome. Well, we're hitting up against time. Unfortunately, we could keep going and talk about science and Star Trek all day. Uh, but I want everyone to, uh, well, first of all, thank you, everyone who joined us in the audience. Thank you, panelists. You guys were great. And please tell our audience where they can find you online. How about you, Rick? Where can we find you online? Yeah, mostly Facebook. Okay, Facebook. So you can go on and get a whole bunch of new friends. <laughs> uh, how about you, uh, Mohammed? Where can we find you? And what's your at? Sure, yeah, I mean, I'm Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter at Moff Noor, M like Michael, A, F like Frank, N like November, O, O, R. I also have a YouTube channel called BioTrekky, B-I-O-T-R-E-K-K. -K. Great. Yep. How about you, Aaron? Where can we find you? And maybe you can also plug your little, your your film, your short film. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, book. Um, it's book too. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a book come out called uh, Star Trek, My First Book of Space. Uh, it's a baby board book for ages uh, zero to two, but also make excellent Christmas presents or holiday presents. Um, so check those out. It's also in companion with Star Trek, My First Book of Colors. So we have a nice steam theme that my friend Rob Perlman wrote. Uh, you can find me online at Dr. Aaron Mack, D-R-E-R-I-N-M-A-C, uh, which is my handle on Twitter, Instagram, and also here on Twitter. Twitch, so go I just stream when I feel like it but you can come hang out <laughs> so, thank Wonderful. you for having me thank you and you guys can find me at Amy Imhoff 1701 because we had to have that enterprise call number in there uh, and thank you so much Cryptic Studios for a great kickoff to Admiralty Day for Star Trek Fleet Week and please everyone stay tuned we've got some great panels coming up mm -hmm. so thank you <laughs>